Okay, so thank you. Probably I should stand here because probably the people online would like to see me. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction, Jean. And also I would like to thank you and uh, the organizers and uh, my colleagues from uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies for having me here today. Uh, it is exactly one year since I gave my last, oh, two years, sorry, since I gave my last in-person presentation uh, that was in Spain and uh, many things have happened since then. And um, yeah, and two years ago, actually, uh, Jean and I were in China uh, in January and uh, we left China just one week before all the flights were grounded. So uh, I think that, you know, many things have happened in these two years and some, and I have reflected also on some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, because some of these aspects that are discussed today, we, I discussed them also with Jean and colleagues back in China, actually. Um, yes, as Jean said, uh, this is not going to be a very technical presentation, essentially because I wanted to have a little bit of more um, opportunity for some of my colleagues in the room. And I know that there are some social scientists around. Uh, and then I hope that we can have a little bit of discussion at the end. So, um, yeah, uh, like Jean said, I have done all my career in uh, engineering and uh, specifically chemical engineering. And uh, some times ago, I was still a student. This book was given to me as a present. And uh, this book is very interesting. It has been actually translated in uh, many languages. And what I found it interesting was that, you know, if you read, especially the last the last uh, statement it says that, you know, an engineer can uh, hit your house, dam your river or build your spaceship, but hardly, um, it's hardly fair to expect him also to make you love your fellow man. And that was really interesting to read that. And the only thing which made me happy was, was referring to a he. So I assume, I hope that, um, Things have changed. There are more women in engineering today. And I hope that actually we do care and love our fellow people uh, around. So, so this, is, this, this was the book that made me start thinking about what really an engineer does. And, uh, and of course, I mean, uh, um, you can spot my beautiful Scottish accent. So I'm originally from Italy. And, um, uh, and then of course, uh, Leonardo was one of the first engineers, I suppose. And one thing that he did really was uh, at the interface of uh, societal needs, analysis and scientific knowledge and creativity. And I think that this is what an engineer should do. And also let's not forget that everything that engineers do, they actually work in, in, in real life. So they do affect society. And AI, and we'll get there, will aff are affecting society very much. So, and will affect society even more in the future. So this, this, this was, uh, we can learn a lot from the past. And of course, I mean, this brings me to the, to, to the issue about ethics, and we'll see how ethics is related to AI in, in a minute. But uh, it's interesting to, to, to realize that ethics that we see like uh, uh, a philosophy uh, matter today, more or less, uh, it was really uh, understood in a completely different way in the old, in the old world and in practice. Uh, Ethics was a way of living, and in, and indeed, it it, it was uh, clear um, in, in in many uh, ancient philosophers, Aristotle, for instance, that young people become accomplished in geometry and mathematics, but only prudent young people. Um, uh, I, prudent young people do not seem to be found essentially because they, it was in, implying that, you know, we have people gain experience and they become prudent. In other words, they will uh, deal with uh, particulars uh, as well as universal issues. And this is extremely important, again, for the role of an engineer. Now, when I started, um, 
Essentially, there were a couple of silos. And uh, Gina told you that um, my background is chemical engineering and the particle technology. And uh, I know very well how to design from an engineering point of view that two silos. I know what I should do not to make them collapsing. I know what I should do, uh, how uh, the flow is assured when you want to discharge the flow, the, the, the particles from the silos. And that is actually what I teach. But uh, I use the silos because for me, this was engineering. This was engineering and this were the social science when I started. And uh, even worse than that, within engineering, there were probably mechanical engineer, engineers were not speaking so much to chemical engineers. And I remember that even within chemical engineering, there were the people dealing with fundamentals when I studied and people dealing with applications. And they were on two separate floors. And, uh, and then uh, the way we were uh, identifying ourselves, you belong to the second or to the third floor. And, and that was really something telling you how much multidisciplinary and interaction was not there. And again, I think that this is extremely appropriate for uh, the place where we are today, because yesterday I had a, an extremely interesting uh, tour around. And I understood that here you really do things at the multidisciplinary level. You are trying to put people together from different backgrounds. And that's exactly what we should do because very often it's the language which is the major thing that uh, prevents uh, communication. So, and then again, going back to, to the, well, I used this, uh, it was first um, uh, Archilocos that said that, but actually, as I have Berlin re to, uh, reworked at the analogy with uh, two animals, the fox and the hedgehogs, because the hedgehog is somebody who looks just at one single big thing. Foxes are more looking at a variety of things. And I, I suppose that engineers for a long time have been more hedgehog and I have, I'm advocating that we should be more foxes and look more around. So, um, yeah, I, I told you that, um, let me go into the technology now and AI. And I, tol um, I told you that I was with Jean two years ago in China, in uh, Changji. And uh, um, actually, a little bit of publicity, Jean. Uh, this is a journal that uh, Jean and I co-edit with, with, with other colleagues from, from China. And uh, this, 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 was, this is a, a beautiful journal, so please consider to publish in it. And actually, we do have a special issue about diversity and inclusion on this journal. So if you have anything that you would like to send us, it's, the, the call is still open. And on this journal, um, Jean was prompting me to say, what is technology? How we are really looking at technology and, and AI? And then I, I started to think about that. I wrote that editorial there. And essentially what we, I, I started to think about, do we need a classification for technology? Do we need to intervene on technology if we realize that technology can bring us to some unwanted results? And that's very much what is AI. AI can bring us to unwanted results. So how should we intervene and should we intervene for, for, in, for the technology that we are developing? And if you look at the technological innovation, uh, there are technologies which are entrenched that they are already well established. Uh, and there are other uh, uh, um, technologies that are emerging. And uh, emerging technologies are those technologies that really still at the research and development phase. And then you have the production, you have the marketing, you have uh, the diffusion in society. And I think that, you know, my colleague who is coming this afternoon, uh, Garth, will probably tell you how you move towards this to, 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 put, to have the technology on the market. And... Um, and just to give you some examples, they are standalone technologies, fax machine, uh, some disruptive one, the compact disc, some incremental, I mean, every year we change a smartphone, something new comes, but it's incrementally done, something enabling and, and something which is really very much affecting almost everything, which is artificial intelligence. And that's pervasive, it's everywhere. 
everywhere and it's affecting us. Uh, we are recording what I'm saying. I'm sure that this will be listened, not just in this room, but not only today, but probably in the future. So I have to be extremely careful about what I'm saying. And this is thanks to COVID because before COVID, I was much more relaxed to give a talk because I didn't need to, to think much about what I was saying. I said, you probably didn't say that. While today, everything is recorded. And then again, we don't know how these data are going to be used in our or a favor or against us. Uh, and then, of course, the entrenched technology can, can affect products, uses, regulations, and have a social impact. And these are already here. They are around us. So I also, this is my personal analysis. I might get this completely wrong. But in, uh, in the 21st century, I, I, I try to say what happened in uh, the first decade, second decade, and then we just started the third decade. What is what, what's happening actually? And the first decade was really about converging technologies. And you see there, there was nanotechnology, biotechnology, and information technology, and, and in cognitive science. Now, there are two things that are really relevant, I believe. Nanotechnology and biotechnology, yes, they are still around, but I think they have reached more or less a sort of plateau. They are not really taking off it like uh, information technology. And, this, and, and the other important thing is that cognitive science is considered to be a technology. And that's something which made me thinking because uh, why is cognitive science a technology? And, that might affect us a lot. And information technology is pervasive. I mean, you use now everywhere, you use it in nanotechnology, in biotechnology, and everywhere. Uh, the third, the second decade was more about the sustainable development goals and the emerging technology. So there were new technologies, and there are still new technologies that are going to be developed. But I think that the, 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 the step change that we really need to do now and, and, and make aware people and the students that they don't need just to press the button like like Jim said it's much more be responsible of what we do and um, well that's just the transhumanism is really a provocative thing there um, but probably we might get there at one point I don't know so this combine, uh, there is a very nice uh, uh, report which was published in the United States and uh, that's about these this converging technologies. But what I found interesting is that they, they say that this technology converge to enhance the human being. So why enhancing? I mean, in which way enhancing? And that's another thing that I would like uh, you to think about and, and myself to think about because what does it mean enhancing? Does it mean that you, and what is good? What is a best or a better human? Um, and those technology, like I said before, they are a different stage of development, uh, but, um, and that they change not only the environment, but they change also the human being. And that's what I found extremely scary if we don't do it in the right way. And that's why I said, well, it might be that we, 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 we think that human, a cer certain sort of human being which are, who has been enhanced can be more efficient than uh, uh, somebody else. So anyway. Uh, so when uh, um, when I was in um, in China, I, I present exactly this slide, and then rethinking about that, there is a very big challenge that we didn't put at the top, and that's at the top now. It's pandemic. And that challenge there is again affected. Not only uh, I mean is affected by AI, and. Uh, and of course, I mean, the only way I believe that we can really make something out of what we have learned, not only um, during the pandemic, but really about this converging technology is really to have the system approach. And we need to work with policymakers, of course. And, uh, and then of course, I mean, 
for me, uh, it's about also diversity and inclusion, which brings also to a different kind of training that I think that we are trying to do at the moment. And very much, I believe that this is something that we should, we should include in, all our, um, in our teaching as well. So uh, in terms of diversity, and this, this again brings me, and, and then you will see why these are related to AI. In 1995, there was this fourth core conference on women for, for equality, devel development, and, and peace. And uh, this was a nice report that I suggest very much to read. And, um, and then uh, in this report, you see that 53% of bachelors and master graduates um, um, are, are women, uh, but then they become 43% when they are, go to the PhD, they become 28% when they go to the research. So there is really an attrition there and people, but, and this is even more important because in terms of researchers, you see that uh, the European Union is not doing so well. The Arab world is doing more or less like European Union, but a little bit better. And what is really, interesting is that you know sometimes the the, the 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 lower percentages are in places like japan and republic of korea which are countries where singapore very much into ai i mean they are very much technologically advanced and uh, women are consistently underrepresented in Germany. and in fact this is what they have in in, in japan and now I think since we are in, I, in uh, AI, I think that many of you recognize this woman here. Yeah, no, no. She's uh, Ada Lovelace. And uh, it's interesting because she's the first one who realized that this intelligent machine could be used not just for calculations, but also for algorithms. So it's considered to be the first one who wrote an algorithm. But despite all that, in this area, despite 47% of the UK workforce is female, in the, in the A, in EI tech, tech sector, 17% only, and only 16% of engineering and computer degree are coming from women. And why is this important? Because if you go to how many programmers and software developers are women, it goes even down. And here, what I'm advocating is that if you want to change the technology, if you want to make the in technology more inclusive, and this is one of the modifications that we should do in the technology, emerging technologies, even before they get into the market, is to have the inclusion at the top when you make the, pro the programs. We had a very interesting panel in Loughborough as part of this uh, um, great opportunity of, of visiting the, the institute there. Uh, where it was clearly said that, you know, you have probably seen on Netflix the, the coded, uh, the coded bias um, documentary. And clearly, I mean, uh, the codes cannot recognize uh, black people. They cannot recognize a different kind of people. So how can we think that a technology can be inclusive, can be responsible if for the people that work on the technology are just male and white. So I think that that's an important point there to consider. The fact that to change the technology, you have to have the input that changes over there. And of course, there are some good uh, uh, outcomes as well. Uh, and again, I want, uh, I want you to think about these numbers. In Malaysia, 50% 50, 50 of women are into information technology. So they work into AI. And India has seen a substantial increase of women in engineering. So I was really uh, very pleased, but also I wanted to understand a little bit why. Why is that? What did they do that we don't do? Right. And if you go to Malaysia, there are three cultural background, India, Malay, and Chinese background, okay? Now, in Malaysia, they have made sure 
that all the three ethnic groups have equal opportunities, okay? This has meant also that in the Malay population, men are not interested in IT. So they, they jump up just because there was a regulation that all the, the, the three ethnic groups had to be equally supported. And, and therefore, they jumped up more women because women were more interested in that. So I'm not advocating that this is something which we should do here, but we should think that some intervention at the, at the policy level can make a huge change of what follows. And again, I think it's a it's matter of input if you want to have the right outputs. Uh, in India, in India, there are more women in IT and engineering simply because um, parents think that with that degree, you are a better, um, you are more attractive uh, to get a, a good husband. So, I mean, you know, it, it might be very questionable, like uh, the motivation, but again, I think the cultural background affects this absolutely enormously, I believe. And uh, computer science, I'm afraid, and this really brings me to this problem about AI, AI is that uh, computer science since 2000 is steadily decreasing. And this is really upsetting that this is especially in the high income countries. So it means that probably in, in, in those countries where we use more these technologies and we have more opportunity to change our mobile phone in every six months, there are less computer scientists that are women. Uh, and uh, the pandemic has really made this even worse, I suppose, that I apologize for uh, the Italian newspaper there, but I'm going to tell you what it's about. This was in June, 2020. Italy had the pandemic starting earlier than the UK. And by June 2020, uh, strong um, uh, regulations, as well as very nice weather, people in the street, the, the number dropped, the, 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 uh, the number of positive cases went very much down. And, um, uh, and then, uh, um, however, when they started in June to look at what happened between January and June, they realized that you know many women during that period couldn't reconcile uh, um, children, house, working in the house, and therefore they left their job. So it says that then 37,000 women left their job from the beginning of the pandemic up to June. And then, uh, um, in July, like I said, nice weather, numbers very low, 80,000 new jobs were created. And, uh, and then, no, sorry, 85,000 new jobs were created and 80,000 of these new jobs were taken by women. And again, I thought, oh, that's interesting, but why is that? And then you, 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 you realize that actually uh, it was, only because these are not highly paid jobs. They are part-time jobs, jobs that were created just like an emergency coming out of the pandemic. And the women were taking that because of course, I mean, there was something that they could have done from home. And in fact, somebody said that, that um, I heard somebody saying that uh, pandemic has done what uh, for a long time was advocated and never reached. And really, our, uh, a pandemic is doing what men like, having the woman at home. So, so I think that, you know, this is something to consider also when we think, should we work from home or should we go to, 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 to the office? But anyway, that's for another story. But, uh, I, 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 and unfortunately, this is something which is very much true also in the UK. So in the UK, there is a, there is a gap between uh, women in engineering in terms of pay gap. But the problem in this is not because similar work are paid less, probably in some cases they are, but it's more because there are very few women at the top. And being few women at the top, of course, I mean, the salaries are lower when you are. So, um, so essentially, what uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to, 
you to consider is that AI will affect these global humanitarian challenges. And I think that they are, these are challenges more than goals because goals is something that yes, we can achieve them, but probably will take some time. For me, it's a challenge, we have to do it now. And again, um, uh, AI can help uh, with, 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 with this because we need to embed uh, diversity and inclusion. We have many data and I think that AI can help us to analyze the data and to make sure that this new technology that are definitely needed for support the um, sustainable development goals are going to really be uh, shared and co-created from the top uh, from the top with, with, with women taking part to this. Now um, um, yeah, and, and, and I think this doesn't, uh, uh, the only thing that I, I, I want to say is that, again, for each one, we have uh, to include uh, engineering and science solution, and, that, and therefore there is even more need for a digital skills. So definitely this is something that we have to push forward. Now, I want just to, uh, briefly, I want to tell you just a little bit of, uh, uh, give you a little bit of uh, uh, AI I could, you a case study for everything, okay? But I want to take just about climate change and what these two interactions are, because climate change is something that we are very much uh, dealing with. Um, uh, AI can help us to fight climate change, uh, can enable smarter decisions making for decarbonizing the industry and transportation, understand, understand how to allocate the renew renewable energies. However, again, we have to be careful because uh, all these are very much linked to machine learning technologies. There is public surveillance, international misuse of data, privacy, transparency, data bias, and we have seen all this. And that again, so again, if th these are issues that are ethical issues that we have to consider when we develop our technology. And, and uh, uh, briefly, um, Engineering is not philosophy. Um, philosopher analyze issues. Uh, engineers tend to find solution and synthesis. So, so the engineer has to be embedded in the process in order to make the difference. And, theref and therefore, this is why I think that we have to act at the very top and be embedded in the de de development of the new technologies. Um, and very similar to medics. Uh, even if uh, for engineers it's much less clear to see the one-to-one -one relationships. We can make a bridge that collapses, them, but we don't know the people who are going to die. While the medics, when uh, if they do something wrong to one person, to, to the patient, they know who is going to die. So that that's psychologically slightly different. Um, but we have always to detect what is the best course of action. And this is sometimes very difficult to identify. Now, um, in, in this context of AI and in the context of uh, what do we do with the technology? Uh, if it's about synthesis, we have to find better solutions. And we make use of previous data. We have used a lot. We have seen today a lot about using previous data. Um, and uh, there are uh, issues there because, again, how are those data collected? How are those data um, uh, used? And what can come out in terms of uh, evaluating what comes out from this data and how this can really affect uh, the, 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 um, the outcome. So here I'm also questioning the data, to be honest, because we assume that the data are fine, but I'm not so sure that they are always fine. And sometimes we trust, there is a trust there, there is a trust for the person who has taken the data and uh, the, the, the person who used the data in AI, trust that person that the data are fine. How do we know that they are fine? And how do you know that, I, I mean, you know, when you take in, in a lab data, uh, you have to see if they are repeatable, for instance, and, and that's something that it, it's very much an ethical consideration. Uh, and also we have to find solutions. And here I want to say something about the fact that we have to make use of speculative data. What I mean that by this, imagine that I have the development of, an, of uh, a software and this software can affect people like surveillance. 
uh, I have now to analyze what can come, what is uh, the unwanted consequences, but it's all my speculation about that. So I don't know yet if this is going to happen. And this is something that I think it's extremely important that we teach and we try to instigate in our students, this flexibility and this possibility of thinking, not just what you see, but also some consequences about some speculation that, that we do. And the other thing that I want to say is that in engineering, we are very much use speculative data. I mean, we are used to do that. And uh, we are used, for instance, to deal with uncertainties because we know very much how to deal with health and safety. So uncertainty is something that it's part of our um, DNA. So why don't we try to use that in, in making the new technology? And, uh, and then, uh, you know, these, these, these technical issues is intervene as soon as possible uh, by using data and really having speculative scenarios. And uh, to me, as an engineer, is really, I have to work with uncertainties. And uh, we have uh, to use probably something that we need to, 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 to use is the risk assessment route. Like we do in, in health and safety, we need to have a risk assessment about what is coming out from the product of our technology. So this is something that can help. I don't think that you, one should stop the development of the technology but we should be aware of what the technology can do and there should be consequent regulations for using that technology because science and technology can never be stopped. It's my opinion, but anyway, and uh, I'm going, I mean, I, I, like this is, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to, to go fast to this because I, I see that probably I'm out of time, but essentially what I want to say is that at the end of the day, it's just, it just that it's our behavior that has to change. So it's essentially the behavior that we have to work on. And as engineers, we have also to make sure that there is an attitude among our students and what and our colleagues to change what we have. And, uh, and again, I mean, we have uh, done uh, a lot of technical work, well, sort of technical work in this area. And one of my final year student did last year did a very nice, uh, um, uh, a very nice uh, project, research project. And again, what comes out from the surveys, from everything we did, it's a lot of commitment and ambition, distributive justice, accountability and transparencies. And, uh, and now to you, the, the, the question is, if these are the key questions that come out from a questionnaire, which was run among scientists, engineers, students, and, uh, and professionals, how can AI and how can the data that we have and what we know about technology affect those bullet points? These are important ones. And I think that that's the question for the future. How do we address that key question? And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, um, just to give you an, an idea, this was one of the things that we found from our survey. The carbonization is important, but it's not urgent. And uh, why pandemics is important and the carbonization is not? Two different time scales. Let's start to analyze the data. Ac accountability. It's, you don't see the, the disaster of somebody dying at the hospital right now. So it's as a direct consequence. And, um, and, then, uh, and then this was also important again for the technology development. 73% of the people believe that individuals are not held responsible for controlling their own pollution which means that they probably blame us for the pollution, for having made these this chemical plants. I don't know why the users, use, I mean, the users is everybody. Um, and uh, some 95% strongly agree or agree that everybody should be entitled to uh, energy and electricity. And again, how do you reconcile this with uh, uh, the fact that we have to have less CO2 in the atmosphere? Um, Seventy-six percent strongly disagree or disagree that advantage disadvantages are shared equally between citizens in the UK. That's a big issue there. I mean, and only ten percent strongly um, uh, disagree or disagree uh, 
when you ask them if they believe that they don't benefit from transition in comparison to other cities. So there are big issues there that, uh, I mean, like I have many data there that probably we can interpret with AI, but I'm not going to present that to that. And, and, and I would like to probably to conclude on this, and that makes me think, one academic teacher said, I don't believe in climate crisis. So what can we expect from our students and how we can expect that they can work in the technology uh, arena if they see our their teacher saying, I don't believe in climate crisis. Uh, and I think that since uh, Jean, probably I'm running out of time, I had some slides about um, uh, teaching and if people are interested, I can pass the slides and we can discuss about that. But I think that in order to really we, to do what we want to do, we need to have uh, more synergetic efforts. So like I said, more input in, in developing this AI and new technologies, more diversity of idea and the skills. When I say diversity, I don't mean just women. I mean diversity in general of everything. Um, disability is something that is very poorly considered in the UK academia. I mean, uh, you know, there are ad hoc solutions for students with, with uh, disability but not a general policy for staff in some cases. So, so I think that's another thing that it's extremely important. And, and there is a lot of uh, work to be done with for reskilling and training. And then probably today, much more opportunity given to the pandemic or gig work. And, uh, and pandemics have shown that we can accelerate the pace for vaccine, for instance. So I think that this is the pace that we need to accelerate in responsibility as well, and probably but well, certainly AI can help in doing all this. So I will, uh, I will uh, stop here. Yeah, that, 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 that's a cartoon of me teaching ethics. And, uh, and then uh, I leave with, with the, somebody said that being a good engineer transcends from engineering itself. So I will uh, stop here and um, hope that there are questions and discussion more than questions. Thank you very much, Rafael. really, really, uh interesting uh, talk.